Science Guy podcast, a show for all genders and species about bringing some humanity and a bit of fun to the world of finance and tech and leaving you with a little something that can help you on your way. All right, please enjoy. Thanks. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Finance Guys in Tech. Today, we bring you our esteemed guest, our MBA intern from this summer, Mr. Alex Solomon. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Alex. Absolutely. Um, usually we do a quick bio and Alex, since you're an MBA intern, means you're going into your second year and you've been practicing your elevator pitch, I'm sure. So why don't you give us kind of the quick, <laughs> the quick yeah, the, like the one minute of kind of where you went to undergrad um, and then what did you do before school and then where are you at business school right now? Sure, for sure. Um, so I'm originally from Long Island, New York, uh, just like Charlie, grew up a town over, uh, went to college, uh, went to undergrad at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, and now I go to Columbia Business School. Uh, and in between undergrad and business school, I was in New York City. So I've really been in the Northeast my whole life. Um, so for that reason, I was kind of looking forward to being in Seattle this summer. But, uh, you know, things happen the way they happen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, my my academic and professional background is is in accounting. So uh, I'm a CPA. I worked in audit <laughs> and advisory, uh, mostly at PwC, <clears throat> for uh, for four years before going to business school. And um, I guess just a little more context on the type of work I did uh, when I was in advisory. At least I worked, uh, you know, mostly in technical accounting type stuff and transaction services. So like M and A due diligence. Uh, mostly for clients in like the tech and media industries. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit about me. Very cool. Very cool. And like you mentioned, you're from, uh, you're from, are you from Comac? Uh, I lived, I grew up on the Dix Hills Comac border. I went, so I went to Comac okay. High School, but my address is technically Dix Hills. Okay. Anyone else from Long Island knows exactly what we're talking about. And anybody not from Long Island has no idea what these towns mean. But, um, that's about, we're, we grew up like probably about 20 minutes from each other. I probably grew up first and then you grew up a decade later, but um, <laughs> but yeah. And um, we talked before too about that you, you were a tennis player growing up. Um, what are some other stuff, like other sports or activities that you like to do going back when you were in, you know, middle school, high school? What was your, what was your extracurriculars like? Uh, I was, a big sports guy. I've always been sports obsessed. Um, all of my extracurriculars basically were, were centered around sports. So yeah, I was a tennis player, um, also a baseball player and uh, a basketball player. Um, oh. I also I, I also ran cross country and track and field. So uh, besides like the the real heavy contact sports, I, oh. I kind of uh, spans the the whole spectrum of athletics throughout my childhood for sure. Ah, oh, nice. Sid was a who's he was waiting to hear you say cricket and soccer, but um, he's used know, to kind of. But he said baseball. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. All right, what yeah, what position? Uh, what, all... I was gonna say what what baseball position? I just very would like to know. So I, I was a shortstop, and then as I got a little older, um, there were, there are a couple better shortstops than me from my town. So I stayed on the left side of the infield. I moved over to third base. Okay. Right on, right on. Cool, cool. Um, and and Charlie, what do you want? I, 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 oh, yeah. I recall. Yeah. I recall. Uh, even your dad was a big time baseball player, right? My dad. He played in college at University of Vermont, and he's currently seventy-two years old and still plays hardball. Seventy-two. Yeah, seventy-two. And he's playing hardball in a men's senior league. Um, he pitches, but he's a lifetime, you know, shortstop coached me and my brother growing up. And then um, he got back into it probably like 25 years ago, he started playing again. And um, yeah, he pitches now. And it, it's like the hard pitch, you know, baseball, which um, yeah, yeah, we had, we had him, I mean, this podcast is about Alex, but I have to say that there was a, a period of time where he played in the over 25 year old league. And I played on his team for two summers. <laughs> um, and we, at one point, like he was pitching, I was playing shortstop. We picked off a guy at second base. It was 
one of the highlights of my professional, uh, not my professional, my amateur sports career, but um, he is a shortstop. So that's why I had to ask. And what did you want to be? What did you want to be um, growing up? Um, I wanted to be the shortstop for the Yankees. So I figured the way the timing lined up, like just right when Jeter retired, I would kind of go in and fill that void that, you know, Cedric mm -hmm. Gregorius ultimately <laughs> wound up filling. Uh, I'm still holding out hope, you know, um, but you know, that ship is starting to sail, I would say. Yeah, right on, right on. I think there, there was like a point where like, the, where you like remember like seeing a professional athlete's like career start and end where you, you kind of realize like, oh crap, like I don't know if I'm going to be a major league baseball player anymore. And like, <laughs> but I think you got to hold on to the dream personally. So, all right, so you wanted to do... Maybe the adult mm -hmm. league, you know? The Maybe what? he ends up in the adult league, you know? Yeah, there's a hope. There's hope. I know a guy. <laughs> there's hope. Man. He, like, flies around the country, like, playing tournaments still, so it's it's pretty, it's pretty oh, luxurious. Man. Not now, but... Yeah, so you wanted to be a baseball player. You went to Lehigh. What did you, what did you study in Lehigh? Did you do, like, finance or something, like, similar? I studied accounting. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do going into college. Um, went into the business school, so I guess keep as many options as possible open. Halfway through, they kind of make you declare a major. Uh, I was always kind of a numbers guy, so I went with accounting. I, I saw that the job placement was strong and whatnot, um, so just kind of went that route, a risk-averse decision, I guess. Yeah. That's okay. And then you and then you got the job in accounting afterwards, or did you did you take any time or go right into the workforce from graduation? Uh, went right into the workforce, took the summer, you know, studying for the CPA. Um, mm. And then um, a couple months after I graduated college, I started at uh, PwC. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, then PwC back to full time business school. What was the what was the transition like? What was the goal for for that? Was it career pivot or was there another reason you did full time? Uh, so yeah, I definitely wanted to do a career pivot. I didn't want to you know stay on the I guess the more common accounting path. If you stay in client service, it's kind of like that partner track. Or if you um, go into go into industry, it's like you become maybe a controller. Um, would kind of be the what you strive to be. Um, so I didn't really want that that path for me. So I uh, applied to business school looking for something that was uh, a little more, you know, strategy and finance than just uh, kind of core accounting. Right on, right on. Very cool. And then you've had your summer internship experience here at Amazon now. Um, did you like interview in the fall? Was that when does that all get lined up for you? It's like pretty much the day you get to business school, you start interviewing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, they really throw you into the fire right away. But um, with with Amazon, I think my interview was you know shortly after winter break, so something around mid January. Yeah, yeah. What, it's like was Amazon something. Yeah, was Amazon something which you were uh, trying for, or were you looking at other options also? I, mean, I looked at a lot of options, but m most of my options were centered around, um, you know, media and tech companies. Um, like I, as I mentioned before, uh, the clients that I focused on while I was at PwC uh, um, were media and tech clients um, that kind of triggered an interest in that space. So I knew um, if, if I was going to kind of focus on one sector, one industry, um, you know, tech is a good place to be these days. Right on. What what helped you get the job at Amazon? Like, what would you tell someone who's a first year going into business school? Um, like some tips or lessons that you learned from that? Um, I guess more generally, just I would say someone going into business school, just know that you're going to be incredibly overwhelmed and you won't be alone in feeling that way. Uh, they really, like I said, throw you into the fire right away. Um, so just just knowing that, you know, that's that's the norm. And um, if, if you feel like it's all coming at you too fast, uh, everybody feels that way. Um, Amazon specifically, uh, I guess my like interview preparation uh, was really focused around uh, like knowing the 14 leadership principles, kind of mapping all of my like my interview examples to different leadership principles to like show that I was kind of like was able to exhibit all of them. Um, you know, I, I had some peers who went into their their Amazon interviews um, 
not being familiar with the leadership principles. And I think one of them, literally the first question they were, they were asked uh, was, you know, which, which LP do you identify with most? And they couldn't give an answer. And that was kind of that. Uh, so I would just uh, be prepared, just know uh, just how important the leadership principles are to, to people at Amazon. Yeah, that's, there's no secret like to the Amazon interview is like whatever level intern, undergrad intern, you, you learn the LPs and, and go from there is like your baseline. For sure. So yeah, yeah. So you got the, the interview kind of lined up, you got the gig. What is um generally like, what has the summer been like for you? Like um, I kind of, I kind of want to hear like, like high level and then let's go back to the beginning of the summer of, of like your experience with it. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a strange summer for everybody, not just uh, interns. Uh, so obviously mm -hmm. I intended to be in Seattle for the summer and with the, the COVID reality, uh, the internship wound up being entirely remote. So uh, anybody who's familiar with New York City real estate knows that you know most of us live in shoebox apartments. Uh, so kind of being, being tr like I, I work in my bedroom, I obviously sleep in my bedroom. So uh, that, that's been a little, a little tricky. Uh, not exactly what I originally intended for my summer, but uh, besides the the limitations. yeah so much for like weekend trips to like the olympic peninsula or something like that i, I, was, I was very much looking forward to that but uh given the circumstances yeah. I, i've been pleased yeah and so um was it like what you expected coming into it or was it wildly different than what you expected I'd say it, it's along the lines of what I expected. Um, you know, I knew I would have one overarching project that would be the focus of my summer that I'd, you know, dive deep into kind of specific subject matter, which was the case. Um, and I've, uh, I've, I've been really impressed with all the people I work with. Everybody's been really supportive. Uh, I was kind of concerned coming into like a virtual environment that I wouldn't, you know, make any sort of meaningful connections or get any, you know, support or coaching. And that hasn't been the case. So I, I've been pleased for sure. Yeah. So like with the virtual stuff, we'll table for a second. What was like one of the like hardest things about the internship or maybe one of the biggest surprises about the internship? So coming in there, like, uh, so I don't know if this is known by, uh, people who are on the podcast, but, uh, Working in AWS, that's that's a line of business that obviously you know I'm familiar with its existence, but I knew nothing about you know data centers. I knew nothing uh, about cloud computing servers. Um, so just kind of learning the ins and outs of that subject matter, it, it was like a pretty steep learning curve early on, and uh, I found myself uh, with my head spinning quite a bit, uh, and you know kind of chasing information like a like a chicken with its head cut off. So uh, that that was a, a challenge, but once I got the hang of it um things things got a lot smoother yeah yeah and um like was there anything like like what was your approach at the beginning was there anything you would have done differently knowing what you know now in like this 10 11 week sprint you know what would maybe some advice you'd give to an intern who's starting out on day one right now um i would say like definitely be sure to get a lot of feedback from all of your stakeholders and something like a, a trap that I feel like I fell into is just getting so focused on the output that um, you kind of uh, maybe lose sight of the big picture a little bit. And obviously, you know, think big being one of the 14 LPs, um, it's, it's not a good thing to lose sight of. Um, so uh, looking back on it now that it's pretty much at an end, uh, uh, there were times that maybe I um, got too wrapped up in the project and uh, kind of didn't branch out to get feedback or and didn't branch out to, you know, just make uh, additional connections outside of my immediate team. So uh, that's probably right. the advice I would give to a new starter. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say this kind of good dovetails into like the next question is like, what would make somebody successful? And I think you're, you're starting to touch on like talking to the people who get the stakeholders of your project and anything else that comes to mind, like what would make a successful summer intern, MBA summer intern? Um, so yeah, I guess if I'm going to tie it back to LPs, uh, to getting stakeholder feedback from all of the, the people who you're ultimately impacting that, that kind of, you know, goes back to customer obsession, which is obviously, um, 
chronologically the first LP. And then I would say um, definitely learn and be curious because um, if you're as an intern, your your focus is going to be you know very granular, and um, I, I would say it's important to uh, like kind of understand a, a baseline level of stuff before uh, kind of giving yourself tunnel vision. Um, so I would say to uh, definitely, it'll be more fun if you really understand what's going on as opposed to just um, just focusing so intently on the, the end product. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Alex, uh, you know, I think uh, what you're suggesting is primarily uh, you know, something at the midpoint of the presentation or maybe at the end of the presentation, you know, uh, at the end of the internship. So, but what do you suggest uh, to somebody who is the, let's say the first 10 days, you know, he's, he's, he's having a kickstart and what will help him get a better kickstart, you know, in his internship, say, any, any suggestions? Definitely meet with every single person on your immediate team and like the stakeholders outside of your team and just kind of really try and understand what it is they do on a day to day, really try and understand the things that are important to them. Uh, and try and get that that big picture knowledge before you know getting before really focusing on on one specific thing that your project's related to really get a, a baseline level of, of understanding yeah yeah mm -hmm. and like what's the what's the biggest thing that you've like learned from the summer like as far as skill wise you know like what's the biggest takeaway like from your 10 weeks working here as far as your personal growth um, so Amazon is very much a doc culture. Uh, you know, there are no PowerPoints here. It's, um, you know, but your, your final presentation is based on a six page paper and coming in, I, you know, considered myself a, a good writer. And what I learned was that I'm not a good writer for Amazon. I was more of a good writer for academic purposes. So I think just kind of learning to to write concisely and get to the point is, has been a big learning for me. Uh, that, that's been a big development area um, that I'm, I'm thankful to have developed in over the past 10 weeks. And also, um, I didn't have much background in SQL coming in. And my project, you know, even though it was sort of based in SQL, it, it didn't go that deep into SQL, but um, I was super intimidated coming in when I found out that the any part of my scope was related to SQL. I thought, you know, oh boy, what, it, what I'm way, I'm in way over my head. I would just say, you know, don't be, don't be intimidated. Um, you know, they're they're really user friendly tools like Hubble, for example, uh, at Amazon that really, um, that really walk you through things that might seem intimidating. You know, that, I'll that's add a very, uh, yeah. I was going to add like that, that, that was, that's a common view people have. When I started at Amazon, I was intimidated by SQL and I didn't have any SQL in my immediate deliverables, but I was trying to like study it. And I, I would kind of add to say to people like, don't just, don't be intimidated and just think like, I need to learn SQL as like a blanket statement, like go in and like learn what you need to, to deliver within your scope, because I, I spent a lot of time on it without any real reason to. And then when I went to AWS and started dabbling it and had actual practical reason, I started picking up little things. But um, I would say to people like, don't be intimidated to like come in with like a working knowledge of something like, like SQL, like come in and be ready to work and learn things within your lane. You know, it might be SQL. And if it is, you'll, you'll have resources to figure it out. It might be something else um, and you'll focus on those, but. I remember having similar similar thoughts when I started yeah. too. Yeah, I think I I also want to underline this point, you know, because according to me, this is a this is a very big takeaway, you know, and and people who work in finance and who don't have any background in SQL databases sometimes get bogged down by the complexity of them. But actually, to be very frank, it's more like Excel only, you know, and so it's very easy to learn on job. So if you can do an Excel, then you can also do uh, write a query so uh, and and it's very easy to learn on job so uh, please please don't get bothered by uh, you know uh, these databases yeah I, I would say personally I still know very little of it but I'm, I'm no longer like afraid you know I, I know how to like ask for the right kind of help and, and yeah yeah, yeah. Or, or, or get somebody who, who knows it well to do the more complex stuff so um let me ask you like and about doc writing i think that's a, a good point like what 
what specifically about writing a doc in Amazon did you learn? Like what kind of, what, what are like any tangible like tactics like for writing that you would say um, for people to, to understand? Yeah, if I, if I had to sum it up in three words, I would say just eliminate the fluff. Um, and then Charlie, obviously a lot of the development I, I've made in doc writing over the past 10 weeks came you know, from, from you. And I think one of the things that you said was if, if a word in a sentence is not adding value, like if you could remove that word and still have the sentence make sense to a reader, then remove that word. Um, mm. And uh, that, that's kind of, I think that's very important advice for writing at Amazon. Okay, this is a, a, a trivia question. What's my least favorite word in, in Amazon doc writing? Uh, I would say it's dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> the word the word dynamic is never needed in a doc in any business document. Okay, that's my one piece of advice that encompasses everything you've said. Just don't ever use that word. It doesn't mean anything. I'll never use it again. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I learned I learned from trial and error too. But um so yeah, I think um I think like I'm kind of interested in like your impression too of um, the culture of like, you know, I, I don't know anymore if like Amazon has a reputation in like at business school as like being a tough place to work or, you know, like it had like, obviously a few years ago, there was things written in like the New York Times article that like intimidated people about the, the work culture. What was your take? And like, what's the, what's kind of the buzz in business school about, about Amazon? I'd, I'd be curious to hear. Yeah, there, there are definitely rumblings, you know, within business school and I think all over that, um, you know, Amazon is kind of a cutthroat culture. It's like contribute or be gone kind of thing. Um, and so coming in, I was a little intimidated by that. Um, and I have found that, you know, there is a, there's a high bar at Amazon, but everybody's, you know, very supportive in helping you get to and above that bar. So um, I, I think cut, cutthroat is the wrong word for it, but uh, the bar is high. Right on, right on. Um, okay, so you, we talked a lot about like work stuff. We also like on the podcast to talk about like extracurricular stuff too. Um, you mentioned like a bunch of like sports that you played growing up. Like, do you have any, I, I remember back in business school, I didn't have any hobbies, but like, do you have any stuff like currently that you like to do when you're not, um, you know, not hitting the books or not in the internship? Do you like to, you know, movies read the news how do you how do you do stuff outside of work or school yeah um i definitely need more hobbies uh, but lately I, i've been you know pretty involved in following politics which i honestly advise against um it's kind of like toxic especially these days so outside of that um i recently got um a peloton bike which has been a, a godsend during you know this shelter in place time I, I got it back in november but it only started to be like incredibly useful and in maybe around march um so that that's kind of you know i spend 30 to 60 minutes a day doing that uh outside of work and uh i like to read um i like to to look at real estate even though you know i can't afford any of it <laughs> it's i guess so i guess it's kind of like a weird hobby just kind of look at houses and apartments that i can't afford and i i love looking at real estate you know <laughs> that's my i on every day i spend almost an hour you know even in <laughs> even in the washroom i'm i'm opening redfin and comparing prices you know <laughs> Me too. Okay, I thought I was like the only one. I thought it was kind of a bizarre hobby, but I saw Sid's eyes good. light up. <laughs> yeah. You know when I yeah. when I joined when I joined, uh, Charlie would never look at real estate, but even Charlie started looking at real estate after staying in my company for some time. Yeah. But yeah. I couldn't help. It. I couldn't help uh, it. It's a more common hobby than I thought. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first time, like, like you got to admit, like, anytime somebody like you know, it's like, oh, I bought a house, or they're like, oh, do you want to come over for a barbecue? The first thing you do is look up their house on Redfin, see how much they paid for it. <laughs> for <sure. laughs> yeah. I mean, let's be real, like, everybody knows that that's the step one. It's whatever, it's just the reality. <laughs> you just like, you just, you just ask them, like, yeah, like, no, what's your address? So I could type it into, you know, Google Maps in six weeks, we have that barbecue. But, 
Um, I actually, I'm intrigued that you said you like to read. So what is it? What do you like to read? Um, is it news or is it fiction, nonfiction? Um, I like to read books. Uh, I do read like news, but I, I um, books, I, I usually don't read fiction. I usually read nonfiction, but I like nonfiction that kind of reads like a novel. Uh, so just, uh, you know, factual stories that are fascinating stories, I guess I would say. So you read Michael Lewis, basically. I read everything Michael Lewis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Give us like a couple, like, a couple books in your top in your top two or three, like just out of the out of the general list that you that you've loved. Uh, a couple of recent ones. Um, I just finished a book called Red Card, which is about um, the the FIFA scandal uh, from, from a couple of years back. That was I'm not like a huge soccer fan to be honest, but um, you don't need to be a sports fan to to find like that FBI investigation mm -hmm. um, and the, the corruption that existed in FIFA. Fascinating. So that's a really good book that I, I highly recommend. Um, a memoir that I read recently that was really good is um, Shoe Dog by, by Phil Knight, um, the founder nice. of Nike. That, that was a great book. Cool. Uh, cool. Yeah, those, those are about, two of my recent favorites. Yeah. What about fiction in all, in all kind of your fiction reading? Anything come to mind as like, favorites that stick out i honestly don't read a ton of fiction um there was a i was on a flight um maybe six months ago uh and i just wanted like a light read so i went into you know one of those bookstores in the airport and i got uh where the crawdads sing it, it was um it was a pretty popular book i think it was in, like reese witherspoon's like book club selections or whatever so it was like it was right in the the front of the I was kind of window shopping for books and I got that you know read it in a, a cross-country mm -hmm. flight and, you know that was a really quick read I enjoyed it but I don't really read that much fiction right on right on um another question that we like to ask people is like if you could meet any three people from all of history um who would you pick hmm. I took a I took a class at um at Columbia last year um, called Napoleon's Glance, which is kind of like a, a strategy class, kind of talking about, you know, flashes of insight and, you know, how how people arrive at, at big ideas and, and strategic ideas. Um, and I, it kind of made me realize that Napoleon was a, a fascinating figure. So uh, if we're doing all of history, obviously our lives didn't come close to overlapping, but uh, maybe Napoleon uh, would be interesting. Um, right. And then, uh, nice. yeah, I, I read about George Patton recently. Uh, another fascinating one, if we're, I guess, staying on the topic of strategy and wartime leaders. Uh, and so, yeah, those, those are two, I would say. Right on. Very uh, business schoolish type of picks, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of like top of yeah. mind. So I just took this yeah, yeah, I know where your head's at. Alex, yeah. Alex is about to write a case study, you know, it yeah. seems, on yep. strategy. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, like, we got to ask you a little bit about, like, Long Island. Like, what are some, what are some, like, top, like, three or four things about Long Island that people who don't know, who aren't from Long Island might not know? Like, what are your, some of your favorite things? Um, something Charlie and I have talked about throughout the summer. I have a bit of an obsession with bagels, um, and the bagels are wonderful on Long Island. Um, another thing about Long Island is that people think it's weird when people talk about Long Island. They say on Long Island instead of in Long Island. I don't know why that's a thing, but it's definitely a thing, and the right way to say it is on Long Island. Um, other things I like about Long Island. Proximity to the North Fork, great wineries. Uh, proximity to um, Montauk, the Hamptons, uh, especially in the summer. Um, one day I hope to be able to afford to spend more time there. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but those are some good things about Long Island. What's that bar out in like Montauk, like that day bar that people go to? Sloppy I can't team. remember. Yeah, something like that. I, I can't remember the names. I, I never went a lot, but we'd always, you know, you always kind of do that kind of stuff every summer. Um, do you love Billy Joel? That's the other question. I, I do love Billy Joel. 
really, Joel. Yeah, I've, I've seen him at, you know, his residency at MSG. I, I must have probably gotten six or seven times in the past, like, three years. Uh, so, yeah, love Billy Joel. How could you not love Billy Joel? Okay, okay. Figured. That was a rhetorical question. Um, <laughs> so, I think another thing that we always kind of ask towards the end of the show is, like, what's your general, like, outlook i guess let's start with this what's your kind of like life outlook career outlook like what are your goals and do, do you operate like with like five-year goals ten-year goals do you think that way or how do, how do you think about your career your future that sort of thing uh i think i i think pretty long term when i think about my my career and my future i think a lot of people who you know go to business school uh, aren't you know very short-sighted because obviously um take yourself out of the workforce for two years and spend a ton of money to go. So if you just think about the actual cost and then the opportunity cost, like it, you'll, you'll struggle to make that up in a couple of years. So um, you're probably a more long-term thinker if you're the type of person who goes to business school. Um, so I probably think, you know, 10 years out, um, I don't have, you know, like a defined 10 year plan. I, uh, I kind of go with the flow a little more than that. Um, I'm not super rigid in that way, but uh, definitely more of a long-term thinker. I try not to be short-sighted. Yeah, and so what's in that What's in that direction in 10 years? Are you gonna be like, you think like up the corporate chain, starting your own company? Like, where, what direction are you headed? Um, or baseball? Yeah, yeah, no, we'll, we'll see what happens with the baseball dream. Um, now that, you know, maybe the ship is sailing on being the shortstop for the Yankees, I kind of focus on being the general manager for the Yankees. There's not really like a much of an age ceiling on that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but no, uh, so I, I kind of have to weigh two different parts of me when thinking about like what my future looks like professionally. So I think I mentioned earlier that, you know, I'm generally a pretty risk averse person. But I also like to think of myself as like an entrepreneurial person. So like I would love to kind of one day go into business with people I trust and start my own thing if the idea were to come. Um, but then there's also uh, obviously most startups fail. So it's it's always uh, it's always a risky thing. So uh, I'm not sure exactly what the future holds. But you know if I had the right idea and uh, you know had the right people that I trust alongside me, I, I don't I I would like to think that I wouldn't hesitate to to go that route. Right on, right on. And what's your like kind of philosophy on life at at this point? How would you how would you describe that? I, a philosophy that I sh maybe I should you know practice what I preach a little more, but a philosophy that I I try to live by is that just kind of control the controllables. Um, you'll, I I think you'll kind of make yourself crazy and burn out if you're if you're getting stressed out about every little thing, especially the things that aren't within your control. All you could really do on a day to day is, is control the stuff that's um, actually like that's in your power to control. So that's something that I would say if I had a philosophy, that would be it. Very nice. Very nice. Sid, are we leaving anything out? No, you know, like uh, talking to Alexis, he seems like a very mature sort of a soul, you know, uh, like control the controllables, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship oh, and risk aversion, you know, like I thought, man, this is a different mm -hmm. Alex, you know. Very old soul. Very impressed. <laughs> I, I try to convey wisdom, but I, I don't always live by that wisdom, you know. Uh, like I said, I wish I practiced what I preached a little more, to be honest. Hey, I, I, I know what you mean. Like, um, giving advice is like, yeah, it's, it's easier to easier to say than to do sometimes, but. Um, no, not for Charlie, you know, not for Charlie. No, especially for me, especially. But yeah, I think that that was cool. Like, I, like we're really glad that we were able to get you on. Obviously, you know, yeah. we've got one, one more week uh, of the internship and we just wanted to kind of capture the experience. I think a lot of people listening, they get a lot of different perspectives from life at, at AWS and um, the MBA intern is not one that we've had yet. So it was an awesome opportunity to get you on it was a good summer you know we had a good time um even working remote so not only thanks for coming on the show but thanks for spending the summer with us yeah, and absolutely. Um, it doesn't feel like it's been remote as much as like you know, obviously it's only been remote it feels like we've been working in seattle together but um i don't know it, it's been an interesting ambiguous time and it was a good test but um I hope you had as much no, fun I, as I, I would also like to add to what Charlie said, you know, that, uh, you know, like 
12 weeks uh, worked with alex you know v3 as a team you know uh, it was it was really great and and uh, thanks a lot alex you know it was really a pleasure working with you you know your sincerity hard work and uh, you know uh, the best thing was like like if if we give any feedback anything everything was incorporated you know and and you helped us think you know so i think i think thanks a lot uh, for uh, being a great uh, you know co-worker and yep yeah, thank thank you guys for the kind words and you know all the all the support throughout the throughout the internship i, it, I don't think it would have been successful if i didn't have you guys to kind of push me and, and walk me through the ins and outs like i said you know i had no background in in aws beforehand um so and thank you for having me on the show this was fun uh, i've never been you know broadcasted before uh so this, this was <laughs> well, thank you thanks absolutely absolutely we're documenting this for posterity and um the summer of covid will live well, on uh, yeah we, we had to document one more thing charlie you remember that uh if charlie writes a book something like that right then somebody oh, yeah. will buy yeah. something you know you have to oh, buy yeah. 100 copies <laughs> right so so, so so when is charlie writing a book you know first of all when is charlie writing a book when is the book getting out 2021 it's going to be a um a heist novel that takes place at amazon okay so so i i promise that i'll buy 100 copies on air you know beautiful thing i can't wait to point back to this delicious yeah you can you can be in for your fridge copies at least i'll hand them out to 11 friends if i have that many friends wait how many are you signed up for I think you have 112 total now. I signed up for 12. I signed up for 12. Yo, what up, everybody? Thanks for tuning into the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe. Feel free to leave a rating, review, what have you. But most of all, go have a fantastical day. Okay? We'll see you soon. Goodbye.